All right, we have a nice healthy audience. Uh, we'll give it one more minute. Okay, let's see how we are doing. Maybe I'll give one more minute, Deborah. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Okay, I think I'll get started. Claire, are we okay with? Yeah, I'm okay. <clears throat> okay, brilliant. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So, good afternoon, everyone. It's indeed a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Leading Lights uh, lecture series. And uh, these lectures uh, honor and showcase some of the most outstanding talent that we have in the medical school, both in terms of research. So researchers, as well as educators, we try and showcase our outstanding talent and today happens to be one such day. And the timing of today's uh, presentation could not have been scripted any better because the speaker was just honored in the Queen's Honor List with an OBE award. So that's really great. The speaker is uh, Professor Deborah Bick. So um, now, before I get going, I also want to say if there are any members of uh, Deborah's family and friends, I also want to extend a very warm welcome to them. Yeah. And before we get going, I will uh, say a little bit about, about Deborah. Her CV is very long. There's a lot of illustrious achievements. I could probably be talking for five or 10 minutes about that, so I don't want to take time that she would be using to give her own uh, exciting uh, you know, insights into research and education. So I'll, I won't do that, but here we go. So she uh, did her undergraduate work in the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, and then had a MEDSci degree from Birmingham, and then won her PhD award uh, from the University of Birmingham in 2002. Uh, and she has been a faculty member both in Birmingham as well as in King's College. And she joined us in 2019, just last year, as Professor of Maternal Health in the Warwick Clinical Trials. And she's also the Deputy Protein for Research in the Medical School. And she is also an honorary professor in King's College and also an honorary professor in the University of Birmingham. So a very illustrious, uh, outstanding career indeed. Um, Deborah has published numerous papers, <clears throat> as well as uh, won uh, uh, grant, grant funding from uh, several of the top uh, funding agencies, including the NIHR. So um, we are really pleased to have you, Deborah, giving this talk. And before we uh, just move on, I want to say one more thing. This talk will be recorded uh, and will be made available to people who missed today's talk for one reason or other. As, therefore, can you please turn off your microphones, put them on mute so that we can all listen to Deborah's talk. So Deborah, it's all yours now. Thank you Thank for you this presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, I'll just start the presentation now. Yeah. 
So Mohan, can I just check that everybody that's on screen for everybody? Uh, so certainly for me. Yeah, I Lovely. think it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Well, thanks very much for that introduction, Mo, and, and um, I'm delighted to be doing my Leading Lights lecture. And um, it's always very embarrassing, isn't it, listening to yourself being described, but thank you very much for that lovely description of my career. Um, and it was very nice to be awarded an OBE this year, and I think it made it even more special because I was included on a list with people who had stepped up to support the COVID response, um, which I felt made it a little bit easier for me to accept an award this year. So thank you for mentioning that. So I'm going to talk about the importance of clinical trials and maternity care with a rather odd sort of follow up of why we need to stop throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I hope that makes sense as my lecture goes through. So today I really want to focus on what's been my passion for research. And this is the time of women's life once they've had their babies. So pregnancy and postnatal care, which is the period of around six to eight weeks following a woman's birth is provided to all women in the UK as part of our universal NHS care. It wasn't always the case because we didn't always have an NHS, but I'll come on to that. And this is a period of care provided by obstetricians in some cases, but mostly by midwives, health visitors and GPs. And what we've seen in the last decade is significant cuts in our postnatal services. And this is despite increasing maternal morbidity. We have much higher numbers of UK women who commence pregnancy with more complex medical and social problems, with medical problems including diabetes, obesity, cardiac disease and mental illness. So this presentation will describe a little bit about the background to postnatal care, the importance of clinical trials to maternity care and why we need to really utilise opportunities for postnatal care to promote longer term maternal physical and mental health. So just to give you a little bit of context to the development of postnatal care, in England in the 19th and early 20th centuries, most births were at home and women would be attended by a mix of midwives who may be licensed by their local councils, their church, but also by lay midwives, women that may not have gone through any training or any registration, but have got skills to help women give birth. And it was very much seen as women's work and it's very much seen as work that took place in the home and didn't need medical support or medical intervention. What was of note, though, was during this time, there was very high maternal mortality, and this was mainly due to purple fever, childbirth fever, sometimes referred to, which we would know today as sepsis, with more frequent outbreaks happening in the lying in hospitals. And these were hospitals that had started to be opened probably in the mid to sort of late 17th century to mainly cater for the women of the slightly wealthier members of the population who could afford to pay for some medical care. And most of these hospitals were only open to women at the time who were married. So we had a series of lying in hospitals and concerns about the high mortality in those hospitals. And in 1867, when some of the first maternity data started to be looked at more seriously, the maternal mortality rate in England was 5.1 per thousand births, so incredibly high. And obviously that triggered a lot of opinion and interpretation of evidence about what to do about it. Um, and this photograph here, I don't know if people are on the call are familiar with the London landmarks in Westminster Bridge Road, but this is now part of a premier inn. But this is one of the first hospitals in, uh, built in London in 1767 as the general lying in hospital. And if you walk past the hospital, you can still see the lying in sort of name at the top of the, um, the stonework. And this was triggering all sorts of issues. And Ignace Semmelweis, who many of you will know for his work, trying to look at the prevention of infection in his own hospitals in Vienna, referred to lying in hospitals as murder dens. And they referred to this not only by the doctors, but also by some of the administrative officials. And not unexpectedly, when looking at trying to reduce mortality, a lot of controversy around whose fault it was and who should make the, take the action to reduce the mortality. And I quite like this quote in that uh, an obstetrician called Dr. Charles Meigs resisted the proposal that doctors should wash their hands between examining patients. Um, his viewpoint was that doctors are gentlemen and gentlemen's hands are clean. So in 1861, Florence Nightingale, using her experience of her work during the Crimea War, started to use some of her Nightingale funds. These were large donations that she'd been given by the public to support nursing, training and, and improving the hospitals that we had opened. She decided to get involved to try and look at midwifery nurse training and felt that she could do something to try and reduce the maternal mortality rates. 
So she opened up a lying in ward at King's College Hospital and she had six lying in beds. Her reasons for this also reflected that there was increased demand from some of the country parishes for trained midwives to go and live in those parishes to look after local women. So Florence wrote about this lying in ward. There was no disinfectant for hand washing and no medical students allowed on the ward. But she did write of adequate linen and no bed sharing, because at the time it wasn't that uncommon to be two or three people to a bed. So this was seen as a good thing. Um, and it's quite interesting to me that Florence didn't really look at Semmelweis's work. She wasn't really, whether she was not aware of it or didn't believe in the evidence he was showing in terms of how infection was spreading from people not washing their hands, doing autopsy and going into maternity wards. But Florence Nightingale herself had to make a big decision because in 1867, she called for her ward to be closed because there was a serious outbreak of purple fever. And the deaths of 28 women that year were reported. And she just felt at that point that she could not do anything to try and reduce the mortality. And she abandoned her plans at that point to support a midwifery profession. What's interesting, though, is that she didn't give up on trying to address why women were dying of purple fever. And in 1871, she published her introductory notes on the lying in institutions, which was really a landmark study of purple fever. She looked at birth statistics from the workhouse to the lying in hospitals, and she compared them with home births. And what she concluded was that it was safer to give birth in a workhouse than in a lying in hospital, but the safest place of all was for, to give birth at home. And she wrote that with all their defects, midwifery statistics point to one truth, namely that there is a large amount of preventable mortality in midwifery practice, and that, as a general rule, the mortality is far, far greater in lying in hospitals than among women lying in at home. And for Florence Nightingale, she couldn't resolve this dilemma of having adequate midwifery training, which she saw as key taking place in a central institution with a large number of patients to look after, but also the safety for the woman in that it was safer for women to give birth at home. So at that point, she more or less, as I say, abandoned her attempts to try and introduce midwifery training and, and really just focused on the nurse training that she was setting up at St Thomas's. So as we moved into the early 20th century, we saw lots of attempts to try and get a parliamentary bill through the House of Commons and the House of Lords to train and register midwives, because at this time they were still unlicensed and unregistered. So the midwives bill was passed with royal assent at the end of July 1902. And within that bill, there was provision for very specific postnatal care, which became the core of a registered midwife's role. And it's quite interesting because if you look at the uh, writings around this time, if you look at some of the history of midwifery in England, it's quite interesting that quite a few people feel at this point midwives lost a lot of their responsive and their autonomy almost because they were registered, they were licensed, and they had very, very strict confines to work within. And that's something that we still have today. So in terms of the postnatal care, the midwifery care was informed by quite really customs and rituals of cleansing, such was the, the a sort of fear of powerful sepsis, which continued to kill women. And some of the midwives instructions from a central midwives board in 1928 are very prescriptive. And that during a postnatal visit, which should take place to a woman twice a day during her lying in period, the woman's perineum should be swabbed around five times a day with a weak solution of iodine or Lysol under thoroughly aseptic conditions. Now, I trained as a midwife in the early 1980s, and when I did my community midwifery, one of the first things my community midwife mentor, who had worked on the community in Birmingham for many, many years, told me how to fold up my midwife's Mac, to take a newspaper with me to put on uh, a piece of furniture or a chair in the woman's house to fold my coat inside out to place on the chair so that I was not picking up any dirt or dust or, or contaminating their house and they weren't contaminating me. And that fear of infection was still very, very prevalent in those times when I started to do my community midwifery training. And of note, even though midwifery started in 1902, there was a gradual decline in maternal deaths. It didn't happen spontaneously. What we saw was a sustained decline from around 1935 onwards in maternal deaths in England. And that, I think, is due to a mix of things, including the introduction of sulfonamides, antibiotics, blood transfusions were being introduced, social conditions are probably improved for women with nutrition, better nutrition, better public health. And I think for me, it just posits the fact that birth 
is always a social thing, it's a public health thing, and it's a very complex thing in terms of culture and ritual and tradition. So we didn't see the sustained decline until around 1935 onwards, when there was a very, very steep drop in the maternal death rate in England. If we turn to the late 20th century, in 1948, as most of you on the call will know, the NHS was introduced. And this really, for the first time, introduced the more formal role of the general practitioner into maternity care. Um, and again, that's a role that we have till this day. Um, and I'm happy to sort of take questions on that because I know people on the call may be GPs. And I think there's sort of quite an interesting shift going on at the moment with GP input into maternity. But the issue from my perspective for postnatal care and midwifery was it, the NHS didn't actually include any national maternity strategy. It reflected the context and environment of maternity care at the time, which was that most births were at home. So therefore, perhaps a strategy wasn't needed because that was the norm and we didn't need a strategy in terms of responsibility for care, for pathways of care, for payment for care provided. In terms of midwifery, during this time, the only thing that changed with respect to postnatal care was that the subsequent revisions to the Midwives Act and the Midwives Rules, which uh, guided what midwives had to do, was that the number of their postnatal visits at home changed from 14 days to stop to 28 days to stop. Other than that, nothing really changed. And we just drifted on really in terms of what postnatal care we're providing over the course of the last century. From 1948 onwards, in the 1950s and 60s in particular, we saw a very big decline in home births. Um, in 1970, uh, the peer report really wanted to make sure that there was sufficient resources for 100% hospital delivery and increased focus on antenatal screening. And the issue for this is that a lot of these changes in terms of moving birth from home to hospital were not evidence-based. It was based on assumptions that you were safer to give birth in a hospital than you were at home. In 1980, the home birth rate fell to around 1%, uh, which is where it still is. The birth rates at home fluctuate between 1% and 2% nationally. Some parts of the UK, they're a little bit higher because they've got midwifery teams that really focus more on home birth. But generally, it's around 2% nationally. And it wasn't until 1992 that reports into maternity actually started to look at evidence for the first time to actually look at what was happening with outcome look at what women themselves wanted from their maternity care. So the Winterton report for me as a midwife was quite a landmark report. It was the first one that actually said that women should be at the centre of all care provided. Prior to this point, women really had very little say in where they gave birth or how they gave birth. And this was the first sort of real detailed report that took evidence from a range of sources to actually come up with the need to have choice, control and continuity of care for women giving birth in England. So looking at current policy, from my perspective of postnatal care, the focus has remained really on pregnancy and intrapartum care. We did see a gradual shift towards the end of um, the beginning of this century, really, the importance of birth in terms of its long-term impact on women and their children. The acknowledgement that giving birth could have consequences for women's longer-term health but also that our system was fragmented. There was variation in outcomes depending on where women had given birth and who had looked after them. Um, and this was something that was starting to really cause quite a lot of concern. The Better Births was another landmark policy report published in 2016. Again, much more focus on antenatal and birth care than care for women post-birth. It did make mention of postnatal care and perinatal mental health services, but not really include any specific recommendations as to how the system should look after women once they've had their babies or how it should look after their longer term health, physical and mental. We had the long, uh, long term plan, the NHS in, published in 2019. Again, there's a little bit in there on maternity, which is mental health, pelvic floor health and breastfeeding, nothing else. And at the same time, as I'm sure many of you too aware from the news reports, we have ongoing reviews of maternity safety there's some really quite harrowing stories coming out from reviews of the Morecambe Bay Hospital and similar things going on at East Kent and also Shrewsbury. Um, and interestingly, the reviews of care at Shrewsbury are now going back decades in terms of looking at why mothers and their babies died. So we have a very good universal health system, but we clearly have a lot of problems 
with some of the uh, system uh, content as well as some of the way that we assess and measure outcomes of how well we've done with our care. So why do we need to stop throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Well, we've had a system of postnatal care for over 100 years now, and it really isn't fit for purpose. It really hasn't been revised. It's not meeting women's health needs. We were invited to do a chapter for the then Chief Medical Officer, Sally Davis, for the 2015 report, which showed very clearly that we could do far better than we were doing to improve the situation for women and their babies by improving the care they had post-birth. But I want to draw attention to the fact that of the women who die in the United Kingdom, around 9.8 women die per 100,000 uh, maternities. Most of the women who die have multiple health problems or other vulnerabilities. These women are not dying of one particular condition. They are looking at a range of issues. And we need to think about how we can prevent that happening in the future. And Marion Knight, who leads the uh, confidential inquiries into maternal deaths, writes very clearly about the need to plan postnatal care for women who have complex and multiple problems, which should include the timing of follow-up appointments arranged with the appropriate services before women are discharged from their inpatient care, and that this is not left to the GP to arrange. And again, we can pick up on that later on. But I just want to emphasise that you know we have this massive gap in how we could improve the outcomes for women and babies. So why are clinical trials important to maternity? Well, sadly, in the last decades, pregnant and birthing women were often subject to routine, non-evidence-based, unnecessary and often harmful interventions. And this could include interventions such as routine episiotomy, uh, continuous electronic fetal monitoring, separating mums from their babies as soon as the babies were born because of fear of infection. So we did some pretty nasty things to women, but actually, when we had evidence from trials, they showed actually they were likely to be worse than actually changing those interventions. So some of the early clinical trials done in maternity and midwifery actually triggered the effective care and pregnancy and childbirth and the Oxford database of perinatal, trial, perinatal trials collaboration, which led on to the Cochrane collaboration. With pregnancy and childbirth, the first review group included within the Cochrane collaboration, and Archie Cochrane, who gave his name to the Cochrane collaboration, wrote of obstetrics as actually should be uh, that they should be awarded the wooden spoon for the lack of evidence to support much of the obstetric practice that was going on at the time. And these are just some of the landmark reviews included in Cochrane reviews based on evidence from international trials. So we no longer do selective versus routine use of episiotomy. We no longer offer continuous fetal monitoring in labour for women if they're low risk. We know how to treat women more appropriately when they develop preeclampsia, which is when they get very, very high blood pressure in pregnancy, which can lead to maternal death and often requires very, very early delivery as, as potentially the only cure for that. And we know much more about how to provide midwifery-led care models that result in better health outcomes for women. But I just want to emphasise that although these are reviews showing what interventions could be effective, they're not always interpreted that way and they're not always implemented. Um, we still have a very long way to go to make sure that all of our information and all of our evidence base is actually implemented in, to, into practice and that we're evaluating outcomes for women of those interventions. Now, at the moment, looking at the current registers of trials, there's over 8,000 maternity trials currently registered internationally. And it's fair to say that trial findings generally have improved maternity outcomes and stop some of the harmful practices in the UK, such as routine use of episiotomy, separating mums and babies at birth. But just to, to emphasise, this is not the case globally. I've been very lucky in my career um, to spend a lot of time in Brazil, where they have some of the highest C-section rates globally. Um, in private practice, something like 80% of women will have a caesarean birth, a planned caesarean birth. And it's quite interesting because if you talk to clinicians in Brazil about why they still would use an episiotomy on a woman having a vaginal birth, their response is, well, our women are different. You know, you're, the evidence that we have isn't on our women. And it's quite an interesting debate because physiologically, I, you know, I can't see why women would be different. But the expectations of women in Brazil is actually quite different to expectations of women in the UK. So if you're a woman in Brazil, where there's much more intervention, surgery is much more of a, an accepted process, whether it be plastic surgery or whatever, 
women complain if they don't have episiotomy, they feel that they were not treated properly. So it's quite an interesting sort of um, scenario. The other issue I want to raise is that because we have stopped some of these routine practices, such as routine episiotomy in the UK, which is a good thing, the downside of that is that often, particularly in midwifery, midwives do not feel clinically competent to perform episiotomy when it's necessary. So this is something that I think, you know, we constantly have to revisit is that we change practice potentially for the good in one aspect, but we're not following that up with looking at the gaps that it then leaves behind. And that's something I think that, you know, I'm very conscious in my work that we're trying to address. So generally in the UK, trial findings have informed clinicians practice, but they've also highlighted this need for better clinical training. And these are trials that I've been lucky to be involved with. Um, we did a very big trial from Birmingham when I was there, looking at mobile compared with traditional epidural block labour analgesia, which found that having a mobile epidural, which meant you weren't quite as heavily blocked from your waist down and meant you could actually potentially move around your uh, labour ward a little bit, you're actually much more likely to have a spontaneous and normal vaginal birth with a mobile block than a traditional epidural block. A couple of years ago, we published the findings from a big trial called Bumps, where we looked at whether if you were a first time mum, if you had an epidural during labour, when you're actually giving birth, were you better off to give birth in a more upright or a more supine or sort of left sided or right sided lying down position? And I think contrary to popular belief, I think people thought that the upright position would be much better. We found the opposite. We found you're much more likely to have a normal vaginal birth if you were lying on your side. And then evidence-based assessment and repair of perineal trauma, the, the perineal management of, the, of, of birth has been a, a big focus of my research. And we did a lovely big cluster trial to look at whether we could improve how obstetricians and midwives were trained to assess and repair trauma. And that highlighted all sorts of issues about the lack of ongoing skills and competency checks that midwives and obstetricians are offered. Now, when I trained as a midwife, um, we were still doing routine episiotomy. I had to perform 10 episiotomies as part of my training, and I had to do one suturing of an episiotomy supervised by a, a medical clinician. That's the only time when I worked as a midwife, the only time when I qualified that I ever was assessed in terms of the competency of my repair of, of perineal trauma. And this is a big bugbear of mine. You know, we've, we've got to look at how people are trained and ongoing training to actually perform their clinical skills to the optimal benefit of the women and also their own practice. So we've done lots of really good trials. We've changed practice, but the implementation of potentially beneficial evidence in some cases is still an issue. And I just want to look a little bit further at this. My question really is, you know, why do some trial findings get implemented, but others are ignored? And I just want to use the example of another big trial I was involved with. Um, and part of the data in this trial was used for my PhD from Birmingham. And we did a very big trial of a new model of midwifery led community care, which was compared with the usual community midwifery care. It was a large cluster trial across the West Midlands, and we recruited over 2000 women. And this trial followed on our work looking at women's longer term health post birth, where we realised there was an awful lot of hidden morbidity, physical and mental health, that women didn't report to their midwife or to their GP, and that midwives and often GPs didn't ask the women about, and women would often just put up with these health problems. So we wanted to know if a new model of community based care tailored to women's needs, which actually looked at evidence based management of common morbidity that those women were asked about by the midwives whether it could make a difference to health at four months and at 12 months postnatally. The other interesting thing with this is that we extended the six week postnatal period. That six week period is not based on evidence, it's an arbitrary cutoff in some ways, but we wanted to know if we extended the duration to beyond six weeks, would that actually be better? And could we replace the GP routine six to eight week check? Again, this has been part of care for decades now, and evidence that we looked at at the time suggested actually it didn't appear to meet women's needs in any way at all. Our trial showed that the new model of care was clinically and cost effective. Women's mental health was significantly better in women that had the new model of care to 12 months postnatally, and the effect size was the same at four months and 12 months, so the effect continued and persisted. 
It was also cost effective because providing midwifery care was quite a lot cheaper than providing routine GP care. So we did a Lancet paper, we did the big report, and we recommended that this should be a new model of routine postnatal care, that the evidence was ignored and nothing changed. And I've often thought about why, you know, why did we ignore this really key evidence? Because it was a system that could have been rolled out. We didn't need to retrain midwives. We could set it up quite easily in rural, in a city, urban, just as we'd shown across the West Midlands, but it didn't change practice. And I often wonder why. It was funded by the HTA at the time, so the area was obviously deemed to be a, a priority health area. But why was it not implemented? Was it because postnatal care wasn't viewed as a priority by the policymakers? As I've already illustrated in current policy, postnatal care is very much still an afterthought. It, it's still very much invisible as part of the strategies for maternity going forward. But also, was this too difficult to revise in the, U, in the NHS maternity systems? Because it would have meant looking at the GP contracts at the time and their funding arrangements. And was that just seen as too difficult? Was it the lack of time or the relevance to practice? Whose responsibility would it be to change? Was it the wrong evidence? And also, there was a little bit possibly of, you know, we know what we're doing already and we're doing it well. You know, we don't need to change. We don't need to revise our systems. And this is really where I think about this issue of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, we have an opportunity based on good evidence. The women liked it. The midwives liked it. Most of the GPs liked it. Some, I think, needed a little bit more convincing because they saw maternity as a big part of their practice, which is very important for obvious reasons. But this is not the only trial that we have that we've published where the findings have just sat and not gone anywhere. And it's it's an interesting conundrum. It's something that I'm really still struggling to think about in terms of how we tackle. So going forward, I think we have very, very long term consequences of not implementing trials like the West Midlands trial in postnatal care and other high quality evidence to revise postnatal models of care. We know that women are becoming uh, much are older when they're giving birth. We know that there's very complex interrelated health and social issues, poorer general health of women. And we know from the confidential inquiries into maternal deaths that women are most likely to die of heart disease, thrombosis, suicide, which remain the leading causes of direct and indirect maternal death in the UK. And some of these issues we could target if we really did follow up these women post-birth, if we thought about their health going forward. Um, and I think the findings that we've had from the trials, the situation that we have with the current situation of maternal health, really does present implications for how we provide care and train clinicians, and also the sorts of trial interventions that we're coming up with in the future. And I think a very big part of the work, certainly in the um, couple of decades I've been doing research, one of the really big shifts has been how we use the voices of those that come into our service. And we need to really keep ensuring that women's voices drive those research priorities. Women know only too well the devastating health and social impacts of adverse birth outcome. And I feel really it's only in the last few years that we've actually really began to sit up and take note of what the women are telling us. And I just want to illustrate with um, some uh, sort of feedback I had from a lady that I spoke to for a recent bid that we put in to look at women's experiences of urogynecology services. Um, I don't know if we've got funding yet, um, we'll hear soon. But this call for research came about as a result of the investigation into women's experiences having pelvic mesh surgery. And I am chair, um, chair of trustees of a charity called Mazic, which was set up to look after women who'd suffered severe birth trauma. And this is one lady um, I spoke to when we were preparing our bid about her experiences of birth trauma and her subsequent health with respect to use of urogynecology services. And sometimes as a researcher, you get a little bit fed up of things not changing and you're constantly doing grant applications and trying to get papers published. And I think sometimes you need to talk to people that you're trying to help and it's their feedback sometimes that gives you that push to keep going. And this is this one woman's story. Um, and she said that following the rapid delivery of a large baby, the midwife argued that I required surgical repair of the perineum and a transfusion. 
However, the other midwife argued that she would handle it and proceeded to stitch the tears, commenting that she wouldn't be doing that again soon. She was right. My son is my only child. Did she also know that the repair she gave me would leave me with a life of incontinence and eventually a colostomy? Misogynistic attitudes and belittling of my problems, being told I simply needed a good cry, a box of chocolates and some tissues, that things would improve in time and that my problems were psychological as a result of experiencing a traumatic birth. Three years after my son's birth, I became anally incontinent at 24 years old, having already undergone mesh insertion for stress urinary incontinence. The consultant has gone on to be awarded for services to women's health. I hope his attitude has changed. And then she goes on to say, failure to understand what life is like living with incontinence, finding yourself a prisoner in your own home next to the loo. It not only takes away your dignity, but your confidence and ability to carry on life as normal. The mental strength required to stay positive is enormous. And just to follow up on this story, this particular lady in the 22 years since her birth I was born has undergone 19 surgical interventions to try and repair the damage caused by her severe birth trauma. Um, and I think it's this sort of feedback that really makes it so powerful and really makes you realise that we have got to sort of keep on trying to address and improve the service um, right the way through. And this is the situation now as well in terms of what we're currently facing with maternity. We know there's much higher maternal mortality in some of our population groups, particularly women from black ethnic minority groups, who are almost five times as likely to die as compared to white women. The thing that I find most interesting with respect to postnatal care is that women are more likely to die post-birth than they are during their pregnancy. Um, around 70% of maternal deaths in 2015 to 2017 occurred after giving birth. And this really, really again bugs me. You know, women are more likely to die post-birth, and yet we still do not think about the postnatal period as being important. And we still have one of the lowest breastfeeding rates in Europe, despite um, interventions, despite public health interventions. I don't know how we can try and improve breastfeeding, but we have to. It's a public health emergency if we're going to tackle some of the health inequalities that we're facing. So we need to address comorbidity, but also we've got to look at the social, cultural and environmental influences on women's life course health, because what happens to women in pregnancy and birth affects their infants and it affects their families. We have got fantastic multidisciplinary teams now, and I think we are shifting to recognise the importance of multidisciplinary input to our trials if we to develop the sorts of complex interventions that we may now need to tackle maternity care issues. We also need to think a little bit more about the types of trial design that we're using. So we have trials which actually include detailed process evaluation of those involved not only so that we can understand how interventions may or may not have worked, but also to ensure that if our findings are positive, others can replicate them in practice. And I think this is something that I'm really interested in doing more work on, is how do we actually build better dissemination and implementation and also sustainability? Because we've got to try and reduce research waste. Trials are very expensive, and most of us as taxpayers are contributing to funding and we want to know that there's value for money there. We want to know that trials associated with better outcomes are actually being implemented. And we also, I think, possibly need to look beyond our health care groups to support change. Um, writing grant applications, there's always a little bit on dissemination and we always tend to put the same sorts of things, you know, two high impact quality papers, um, you know, a summary of the report on the website. Maybe we need to look to business, to um, the arts. Maybe we need to look beyond our healthcare sort of bubble to think about getting messages out there. And I know lots more people are doing things like podcasts, are working with animators, are making films, which I think is brilliant. And I think we need much more of that um, as routine when we're getting trial messages out there. We are doing some great work at Warwick, and um, I'm also pleased to be working with a really great team of people. So our trials at the moment do reflect some of these health priorities, including uh, weight management for women with high BMIs when they book for their pregnancies. We're doing work which is being led by Birmingham 
I'm involved in uh, being as chief investigator for part of a program grant, which is a trial looking at trying to improve women's pelvic floor muscle exercises. And with Siobhan Quemby and the team, including Joe Fisher and colleagues from uh, the trials unit, Sarah Wood and various other people uh, working on the trial, Martin Underwood, we're looking at whether women who have a larger birth weight baby are better off having that baby a little bit earlier. So they are prevented from having trauma caused by something called shoulder dystocia, where the babies become a little bit stuck when the woman is trying to give birth. And Siobhan and her team are doing some amazing work to try and look at prevention of recurrent miscarriage. So we're doing some amazing, really sort of nationally and internationally relevant work within the trials unit at Warwick. We are not resting on our laurels. We've got more trials planned, including going back to looking at postnatal triage. And I'm hoping that we uh, will work with colleagues in primary care at Warwick, including people like Sarah Hillman, Jeremy Dale. And we're also obviously at the moment considering the impact of COVID-19 and how that is going to influence the research landscape and the agenda for research going forward. And from the maternity service provision, we're also awaiting the implications for recommendations for our services following the current safety of maternity service inquiry, which Jeremy Hunt is leading at the moment. And um, again, I'm quite interested in this because I think they are getting in women representing different service user groups. So there's much more focus being given to those women's stories about what went wrong for them and how we can fix the system. So we're doing some really excellent collaborations across the university, at the University Hospitals of Coventry and Warwick and other clinical centres. And we're also supporting a range of pre and postdoctoral students, MD students. So a very important part of our trials work is actually bringing in the next generation of researchers who will hopefully carry on and keep tackling some of these priority areas. And our work is also contributing to development of research priorities, both nationally and internationally, and also research questions that funders are coming to us asking, where are those priorities? And it's, it's fantastic that at Warwick, we're actually helping support the agenda for maternity research going forward. So just to conclude, I go back to Florence because I felt she felt a, a very sort of relevant quote here in that she wrote in 1893 that everybody must be born. There is probably no knowledge more neglected than this, nor and more important for the great mass of women. And I'd like to think over 100 years on that we have changed. But actually, I think the change has really only just begun in terms of listening to women and finding out how better we can help them. And I just want to conclude to say thank you to friends and colleagues at Warwick and also to my family and um, this picture is my my own daughters Hannah and Rosie and I would love to think that when they have their own children that they have the best possible experience of pregnancy and birth because those of you who are parents who are mums dads those experiences stick with you forever you don't lose them and that's absolutely essential to remember when we're doing our research thank you Thank you very much, Deborah, for that outstanding presentation that was both scholarly, but also was uh, very accessible to everyone. So it was really great. Um, we also know how popular this talk was. Just if you look at the sidebar, the number of questions that you have there well, is already a testament of how well this talk has been received. Now, I think let's start with, I think I would like the, the people who have written the questions to themselves ask the questions. So, Siobhan, do you want to ask your question? Uh, this is Siobhan Quemby. Hi, Siobhan, are you? Hello, hello. Yeah, hi, hi. yeah. Hi. So, um, thank you very much, Deborah. That was a fantastic <coughs> lecture. So, obviously, I loved it. So, I thought maybe you could expand on how many women actually die in the postnatal period. You said that 70% of all the deaths are then, but can you give a number per year to try and make people um, understand exactly how important this is, as well as how you feel it's also deaths? Yes. Well, I think it, the confidential inquiries are triennial, so every three years. And I'm, I think in the last triennial period, there was around 267 maternal deaths, um, which doesn't sound a huge number. Um, it works out at something like 9.8 deaths per 100,000 maternities. So it's it's not, thankfully, a massive number, but we're still not doing very well compared, you know, despite our universal healthcare system. And of those deaths, when you look at deaths 
from the first postnatal day to six weeks and then include deaths beyond six weeks, um, around, um, I'm just trying to think, somewhere 184 of those deaths took place post-birth. So it's a very, very important number to think about, um, especially when some of those deaths may well have been preventable through better planning of care for women once they'd had their babies. Um, and I think what's interesting is that, you know, no one seems to be tackling that, Siobhan. That's, that's where my frustration lies, is that we know this is happening, but we're not doing anything about it. OK, I think Siobhan. Um, Thank you. You have one. OK, all right. So we'll go to Eleanor Malloy. Eleanor, are you there? I am. I was just trying to find the right button to unmute. Okay. All right, good, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so part of my PhD actually is looking at the experiences of LGBTQ um, individuals and traumatic births. Um, <clears throat> but what I was wondering, because it's not really something that we collect information on in terms of gender or sexuality of people who give birth. So do we have any data that's being collected um, or any feedback from trans men who give birth in the UK? Um, that's a really good question, Eleanor. And um, when we recently put in um, for this year at Garnibid, we worked with a great person called uh, Ruth Pierce, who was at Warwick and um, is now based uh, at Spe Spectra Charity, I think it is, in, in London, who's actually doing work in this very area. So if you want to email me outside of this, I can send you her um, email address. Um, and there are certainly groups of midwives in London that well, were looking at this issue. Um, and I can probably also give you contact details of people at King's looking into this. So there is <clears throat> there is a growing body of interest in what's happening to the outcomes of, of um, trans people giving birth. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. OK, um, we'll now move to Nisha Periyatambi. Nisha, are you there? Uh, yeah. uh, hi. Hi, uh, Professor De Bruyne. It was an excellent talk. So, one uh, part of my PhD is to look at the postpartum, improving the postpartum care for GDM women for the type 2 diabetes screening. So <clears throat> I've done some preliminary data and around 50% of the women tend to miss the uh, postpartum screening. So how do you, what is your opinion on improving the uh, uptake in postpartum mm. care? It's, it's interesting. Whereabouts do the, do the women live? Do they live in a city or a more rural area? Uh, it is the secondary care in George Elliott Hospital. Manita. OK, yeah, it, it's interesting because um, usually we, when we've done postnatal studies before, we found the uptake for the six week check uh, is, is pretty good. But what happens, and I don't know if any GP colleagues are on the call here, I think sometimes there is miscommunication between the hospital and the GP in that GPs often don't get the information they need to be able to provide the care that woman needs. So it, it may well be that these women are being missed because they just, A, they're not being told they need to go to their GP in the first instance. And B, if they do go to the GP, the GP may not be aware of their pregnancy history. So I think there is, that's part of the work that, you know, I've been talking about with Sarah Hillman is that we've got to think about this better communication between the hospital and the general practice. Um, and it may well be that that's where they're being missed because the GPs just aren't aware of their history. OK, yeah, thank you. OK, we have a number of questions, but I think we have some time, so we'll keep yeah. going along. There's <laughs> Rebecca, Rebecca yeah. Mc, McEwan. Rebecca, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I yes, hope I, I can see hear your name right. I'm sorry if Hi, I Deborah. missed you. Yeah. No, that's OK. Uh, yeah. Thanks for a great talk, Deborah. Um, I just, my question was really about... Um, the provision of physiotherapy in the postnatal period and what your thoughts on well I guess how much is provided routinely and um what your thoughts on that the quality and quantity of it and whether you think um more work's needed in that area or whether you, what your thoughts on that really was yeah I, it's a really good question and um certainly when I did my midwifery training in Birmingham the the physios were on the ward the postnatal wards every day and they were taking women through pelvic floor exercises. If they'd had a C-section, they were uh, teaching them about abdominal exercises to, to get their recti, abdominal recti muscles back. Um, and as a mother of twins, I never did my exercises. And so my, my muscles are awful. Um, you know, I, I can't do aerobics or anything because my muscles are so, my stomach muscles are so bad. And I think what's happened is that we have lost that expertise. 
midwives are not advising women on pelvic floor muscle exercise training during pregnancy or after pregnancy. And we know that from the work that we're doing for our appeal uh, program grant at the moment. And I think we need to get physios back on the wards. You know, we, we have women uh, coming through with uh, incontinence of urine. Uh, we've got women with prolapse that need advice, need support. And those women don't know where to go to. Um, and I don't know if physio, if, if physio has changed. I don't know if, if all physios now need to do obstetric training or whether it's an option in their training or whether they just don't do it at all now. Um, but I really feel that we've got to go back to the system of having physios on hand for all women who've given birth to advise them on, on recovery and uh, getting back their muscle tone because it's so important for their long term health. Yeah, I agree. And I think when I did my training, especially, it was kind of it wasn't taught enough, I don't think, if at all. And I think it was one of those things that you could go into it, but you'll learn about it if you do. And um, yeah. I definitely think more. It does. And, and just to follow on from that, in the long term plan, um, it's, it's quite interesting. I wasn't quite sure what they picked on uh, uh, of all the things they could have picked on for maternal health. They picked on pelvic floor issues. And I think that's because so many women are affected by incontinence. And we see these awful tenor lady adverts saying, you know, you just put on your, your lacy you know, incontinence pads and you'll feel great, um, which is not actually correct. Um, so I know um, the Department of Health are looking at actually setting up more specialist physios for maternity um, with also specialist midwives that can advise on, on aspects of physio. So I'm hoping, obviously COVID may have put pay to those plans, but I'm really hoping that that will come off because that will help so many women um, going forward. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I think we, we, we have so many questions. I'm gonna, let's take four or five more. Yeah, Debbie Murray next. Debbie, are you there? I am, and I think um, my my answer or my question was answered um, by Eleanor as well. But um, thanks, Deborah. That was great. And just to say, I, I just wanted to talk about COVID and and breastfeeding, the attitudes, and how that's had an impact on attitudes and practices. Really, it's it's an interesting. I've I've heard a bag. I know there's a few um, comments. I've got colleagues who are community midwives locally around Warwick, um, sort of. Leamington area um, who think some in some cases it's helped women because they've been at home they've not been able to go out they've had their partner at home and they've felt a bit more able to breastfeed um, but then I've had other women um, who apparently have been very frightened of breastfeeding in case they pass on anything to their babies so I think for women who've got problems um, I think it's been difficult because because of remote contacts it's very difficult I think to do a breastfeeding assessment online like this and um, one of my colleagues who was trying to do, she's a midwife, was trying to help a woman. She said it was the most amazing camera angles to try and, you know, look at, you know, how this lady was holding her baby and if it was latched properly <laughs> and all sorts of things. So I think, uh, and I know there's another question from Siobhan about how's COVID affected postnatal care. I think it's affected it very badly. Um, I think it was because postnatal care is always the invisible bit. It's a thing that is most likely to, to be given up. Um, I think the local services did try and do everything remotely, but they then started to see a little trail of babies and mums being bounced back into the unit with problems that shouldn't should be preventable. Home visits, they hadn't had one to one care. So I really hope going forward that um, breastfeeding is seen as something that you know still needs to be supported. And there are ways and means of getting to see women um, a way you know, in the home or in the clinic, which could be um, using sort of social isolate spacing. But I think my concern really is, is is the social isolation impact on the mental health, which will impact on the physical health and whether, you know, whether women did feel confident to carry on breastfeeding and get the help they needed when they needed it. Um, and interesting, nation, internationally, I know there was conflicting advice. So the WHO was saying carry on breastfeeding, even if you've got symptoms of COVID, you should still carry on feeding. But you know, just take extra care, extra precautions. China, I think, was saying women shouldn't breastfeed at all. You know, so th it's quite interesting, even, you know, globally, there's been a lot of discrepancy over what to do with breastfeeding. Yeah, Our advice yeah. in the UK is carry on. You know, you, you don't stop breastfeeding. I've seen okay. some interesting, sorry, I just wanted to say, I've seen some interesting things on Facebook where you've got breastfeeding mothers now with masks on. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I thought that was an interesting message that was going out. Thanks very it's, much, Dave. Yeah, it's very difficult. Okay. I think there's a comment from Heather Draper. Heather, do you want to um, 
tell us about uh, what you're thinking. Heather, are you there? Okay, we'll move to Andrew McCain, if not. Andrew has a question. Andrew, are you there? Yeah, hi Deborah, that was great. Um, I'm just interested in like twins and how and how management of twin pregnancies, you know, divert differs from how you know singleton pregnancies and mm. you know, obviously things like shared placenta and the implications of that and you know extremely limited amount of intervention possible, right? So I was wondering whether what work's being done in that area to sort of look at that. Yeah, well, I suppose uh, speaking as a twin mother, um, it, it's it's you know obviously you do get much more um, follow up intervention. And I think these days they are very reluctant to let twin pregnancies go much beyond 37, 38 weeks. So there is a, a sort of, you know, a, a more of a trend to actually induce those pregnancies to prevent problems um, during labour. So I think twin pregnancies, um, you know, it, it very much depends on preterm birth because that will affect, you know, all sorts of issues. Um, I do hope that women who are having twin pregnancies get don't get separated because I've had I've looked after <clears throat> one baby was in one unit one baby was in another because of lack of, of space um twin pregnancy mums we may we know maybe more at risk of things like depression because of the sort of just the physicality and the tiredness of looking after twins but actually um a lot more mm -hmm. centers and, and I'm talking about colleagues in Birmingham they do have specialist midwives who will help those mums who will you know help support the, the sort of twin pregnancy women um and I think it can be quite frightening. I think women who's, you know, who have these babies have got a shared placenta, who are monochorionic, monoamniotic, you know, that they do have a lot more risks, but, are, you know, they are monitored very, very carefully. And um, I, I, Siobhan would probably, I don't know if she'd tip me off for saying this, but I think sometimes it's just lap of the gods as to, as to how it goes, you know. Uh, yeah. it, and, you know, I, I had a very sad case, uh, what a lady I was involved with at St Thomas's. And, you know, started to go into labour at 20 weeks and there was absolutely nothing we could do. She had a stitch, you know, she had the best care possible, but there was absolutely nothing we could do. So I think it's more around when you have a twin pregnancy, it's sort of advice, but not advice that hopefully will put you off. Um, I think a lot of mums have a very, very tense, nervous pregnancy because they don't quite know what will happen at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and postnatal care, unfortunately, in most cases, will not be any different from postnatal care if you're having one baby. Um, so we're getting better. I think that nice guidance is much more evidence around management of the second twin. There's much more evidence around the need to perhaps deliver those twin babies more um, a little bit earlier. Um, so we're getting better. <coughs> um, but I think there's still a big gap in terms of how we care for those mums and babies going forward. Yeah, okay. especially, I mean, especially to say, you know, breastfeeding is... <laughs> It's a yeah, it's, it's, it can be done. You just need a bit. It can be done very successfully. You know, you will produce as much milk as you need. Yeah, um, but just the, so, of the, just the mechanics of it. Yeah, it's really difficult, and the skill set involved. They do. Though. I mean, even just organising, you know, pillows and and having a drink there and the phone. I mean, it, it, you know, but it can be done, and um, you just need what we really fail women is, is giving them the good one or two hours just to get breastfeeding going of solid yeah. input. Yeah. Um, but it can be done, but it is damn hard work. And, and I speak over 30 years ago, but personal experience is it, very hard work. <laughs> Thank you. Dave. Okay, we'll just take two more questions. One from Claire Hawks. Claire, are you there? Claire, are you there? Okay, if not, let's move to, I can read it out, but Greg Scott, will, and then I can read out Claire's. Greg okay. Scott, are you there, Greg? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. hi, Greg. Hi, uh, Deborah. Thank you for the talk. Uh, really good. Um, I was just wondering, my question was, do you feel more could be done to uh, prepare first time mothers for their pregnancy um, due to the potential for having a traumatic experience and how that can affect them postnatally? Yeah, it, there's a big debate going on about that at the moment, I think, um, because there's been issues around uh, women not being told, you know, having a first pregnancy, if they've got a bigger baby, if they've got diabetes. That women are not told about all the consequences of, of having a <clears throat> baby or having a medical condition. So there's a big issue around the extent to which women are informed of the potential risks because A, you don't want to put women off being, uh, you know, worried the whole time through their pregnancy, but also women need to be informed so they can make decisions about uh, birth mode or about their, you know, uh, what sort of intervention they want and when they want it. So it's really, really important. 
I do I do feel very concerned. I think such is is the way practice is going at the moment that um, you know we'll end up with women signing all sorts of consent forms, you know, to say I agree to have this done, you know, and and that I think is going the other way. But when I talk to women who've had very very severe perineal trauma. I think the issue for them is they weren't told that that was a risk. You know, it, it's it's not the fact it happened. These things happen. But it's the fact that nobody told them it could happen. But if it does happen, we could do something about it. So the biggest issue I have is women who had these awful tears, but they were not picked up at the time they gave birth. <clears throat> so women developed problems and were, only, were then told five, six, seven years down the line, oh, it's because you had a very, very bad tear. And this is what's the consequence. So I think... We, we have to have a very, very good balance between information, but also not, you know, really scaring women because pregnancy is worrying enough without you then having to think about all the things that could go wrong. What we have to bear in mind in this country is the majority of pregnancies and births have a good outcome. What we've got to tackle in this country is where we know we could reduce the bad outcomes. And, and that's where we've got to keep the balance going, I think. OK, I'll read out Claire's uh, question quickly. So. It's a, has there been much research into implementation of research evidence and development and then trials of implementation strategies specifically for postnatal care? Mm. There's certainly been a lot of work done on implementation and um, I was lucky enough to work um, several years ago with colleagues in, in Canada and Australia looking at trying to get better implementation. Um, there certainly hasn't been any strategy for postnatal care, um, and that's where I feel that you know possibly our work needs to sort of you know change direction and, and address that gap. So we we know a lot about why things don't get into practice. You know, often it's because of lack of leadership, it's the resource, it, it's the types of things that we would all assume would be the reasons for not changing practice. But it just, <clears throat> it just it's interesting that some of our some trials, which may actually may may not be the best sort of evidence have actually got into practice quite quickly. And that's because I think people were ready to change or people's um, equipoise had gone. People believed that this was a better intervention already before the trial actually came out. The trial just reinforced what they thought. Um, so we've got a lot more work to do on that. And I think implementation, dissemination, and also <clears throat> the sustainability of those changes is, is something that we need to address much in much more detail, particularly postnatally. Okay, thank you. So before we close, can I request everyone to unmute and give a nice <laughs> round of applause to, to Deborah for this great Thank you very much. And, um, <clears throat> thank you. And, uh, finally, 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 before we go, I'm going to present this really beautiful uh, crystal obelisk. Object. Um, and uh, it's going to move at the speed of light. Yep. from Warwick Medical School to Deborah's home right yes. there. Okay. There we there go. We Thank go. you very much. Oh, and here it is, magic, by That's magic. That's it. <laughs> home okay. yeah. Thank you very much, Mohan. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, everyone, for Pleasure. this. Thank you very much, to everybody, for questions. listening. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.